Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live, also Danoon Institute of Biblical Research. And I, I am again coming back um, to a, this part two of a series of videos that I'm doing in reference to the, uh, the, the, this movement uh, where people like Mr. Shapira here are leading the, 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 the true believers into a New World Order doctrine. And things I'm going to present to you tonight are absolutely mind-blowing. Uh, it will really require deep, deep, deep uh, thinking on your part, uh, an open heart to really see, because we're going to look at prophecies that we have never before experienced. And I want to share those with you. So without any further ado, I want to re quick play a clip from the video that I did called Shocking Discoveries Made. This particular version is on Israeli News Live, 35,000 views on this video already. Uh, I haven't looked at the one on, on um, iConnectFX.com, but uh, uh, the number of views is not as important as being able to translate it in multiple languages and share this information with the world. Let's listen in. I'm moving it kind of forward because I want to get to the part where he talks about Jeremiah. That's, that's where I wanted to get. Let me back it up a little bit. Our salvation is complete. If you heard that, I'm saved. I'm good with potent. Here we go. Right here. We sometimes have the notion that we already, because we received the Messiah... Our salvation is complete. If you heard that, I'm saved, I'm good, everything is good with me, hallelujah. But let me say it clearly and bluntly upon the entire house of, of prayer, upon all of the people who are watching right. No, the redemption, the journey is not complete. Nobody here in the room should be happy or satisfied today that the redemption is complete. It is not complete. It is not complete for Pastor Mark Bells. It is not complete for Rabbi Shapira. It's not complete for Avatami Ministry. And it's not complete for El Shaddai. Listen closely now. It's complete only when one and only thing happens. Are you ready? When Israel walking the land when Israel as a whole walking into the relationship and the new covenant with the God of Israel then all of Israel will be complete and then our redemption will be complete as well I know it's important to understand that but hello Jeremiah 31 says Bill I'm giving a new covenant to the house of Israel and to the house of Gentiles and Judah. It doesn't say, I have given it to the Gentiles. The nations need Israel. Okay, then he's going to say you need Messianic uh, Judaism to see succeed. Yes, you do. That's what he says. Now, incorrect, totally false. Now, one thing I wanted to share with you uh, before I begin to go into the book of Amos and we really break down some new things about this, I want to back up and let's remember exactly what it was in Jeremiah 31 that he quotes. He's quoting from verse 30. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Okay, for as much as they broke my covenant, although I was Lord over them, saith the Lord. Now, even the part about they broke my covenant is very important to remember. We're going to end up addressing this very, very soon. But Mark is, excuse me, not Mark, but uh, uh, Yitzhak Shapira is putting that scripture as a future fulfillment. When that is clearly in the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, verse 7, for if, if at the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Wow. There, did you just read what I just read? For if that, the, that first covenant, talking about the law that came out of Moses, 
If it was faultless, then should no place have been found, been sought for the second. What? Are you kidding me? The covenant that Yahweh gave to Moses had faults? According to the book of Hebrews, yes, it did. Notice what else it says. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant. And I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith, a new covenant he hath made, the first old, now that which decayeth waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So clearly, according to the book of Hebrews, it's already fulfilled. And notice another thing that he brings out, and this is where it shows fault with the old covenant. For I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities while I'll remember no more. You see, under the law, there is a remembrance of the iniquity, and it's visited even under the fourth generation. That's a fault in the law. Wow. I'm just quoting you the scripture. I mean, you do with it what you want, but I'm quoting you the scripture, right? That's what it says. So the fulfillment is already there. We see it plain as day in the New Testament. Why would Yitzhak Shapira then say, you can't get, you're not going to, your redemption isn't complete until the house of Israel came in. Well, okay, your redemption is complete then because we know according to Acts chapter 2, verse 36, be it unto you all, that all the house of Israel, all the house of Israel, see, they were already there. Actually, it's a remnant as we saw, as I we did in the, that message that last week there, uh, or yeah, well actually Sunday, I believe we did this message Sunday there. Let me just go down um, quickly and find that for you. That um, I showed you how that only a remnant, only a remnant would come out. Um, uh, so beautiful too. We went into the, the prophecy of Jeremiah 31 and how that, oh, it's just amazing. Uh, uh, I, 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 I was blown away by that one as well. Uh, I can't seem to find it fast enough for you, but you already know that there was only going to be a remnant that would come out of a remnant of the house of Israel. Even though they be as a sand of the sea, as the Bible says, only a remnant would return. So when Yitzhak Shapira says, you know, they all heard the trumpets blowing and stuff, then, and he said it's going to have to be the same way in the end of days here, then they all have to come back. But it's totally... Everything he's teaching there at Mark Biltz's place there is completely contrary to the Word of God. That's where the trouble comes in. Now, I told you you're going to have to think deep. And we're about to look at Amos chapter 7, and you're going to need to think deeply. We're going to look at the prophecies here in a way you've probably never, ever imagined before. So we're going to begin with verse 9. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. I will turn your feast into mourning, and all your songs into lamentations, and I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins, and baldness upon every head. And I will make it as the morning for an only son, and the end thereof as a bitter day. I'm going to pause there just for a moment. First off, the word son is not in the text, but it's implied because the word that is used there when it says the morning for an only, the word only that they're using, Yahidaya, uh, excuse me, Yahiyad, is it's basically um, it's for, for something special. I find it interesting, though, because it is clearly 
showing the death of Jesus Christ. I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. You remember how everything goes dark when Jesus is on the cross, when he died? I will turn your feast into mourning, your songs into lamentation. I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins. Okay. In the end thereof, going down to the last part, in there thereof as a bitter day. Jesus died on the cross. Now, but let's watch very closely. Verse 11 is where you're going to have to really begin to think deep. And it's a verse you've heard probably a million sermons over, so to speak. I'm just saying that, exaggerating, I know. But we're going to look at this a little differently from, from traditional teaching mainly because of what happens in the next few verses afterwards. So I'm going to read that verse. I'm going to read all the way down to the end of the chapter, next few verses here, and then that way there we can get a picture of what's going on. Verse 11, Amos chapter 7, or we chapter 9, forget which one, chapter 8 actually, I think. Behold, the days come, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord or the words of Jehovah. And they shall wander from sea to sea, from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. In that day shall the fair virgins and the young men faint for thirst. They that swear by the sin of Samaria say, As thy God, O Dan, lives, and as the way of Beersheba lives, even they shall fall and never rise up again. This is where it gets very interesting. There is a thirst that is created for the words of Jehovah. Basically, it's a thirst for the law. There's not a famine for bread, nor the thirst for water. But there is this group that comes on that has a thirst for the law. They literally will wander from sea to sea, north even to the east, and shall run to and fro to seek, basically, the law. Debeah, Yehovah, is what we read in Hebrew, and shall not find it. <laughs> this is what's fascinating as well. They don't find it. And that day shall the fair virgins and the young men faint for thirst. And so now he's telling you who they are, the young people of that day. They're going to they're going to be so thirsty they're going to faint because they can't find the living water. Although the living waters are poured out. Although Christ already has come and given his life, and he is the bread of life, he is that fountain of living water. That reminds me. Let me just see if I can pull that scripture up. I'm hoping I can get it here. Let's see. John chapter 7. In that day, last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. Right? He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But the problem is, as we read in this amazing prophecy, let's go back up here, yeah, Amos chapter 8, the famine is not even for Christ, but there becomes that thirst. They want to go back to the law. Most of us, when we look at this, 
we've looked at this in the opposite way. We think of it being of natural bread and natural water. And that really what God is saying is that there is a famine, though, for the true word of God. But I'm looking at this in a little bit different light because of what it says here in verse 14. They that swear by the sin of Samaria, who are they? These virgins and young men that are thirsting for this law of Jehovah. They swear, swear by the sin of Samaria and say, As thy God, O Dan, lives, and as the way of Beersheba lives, even they shall fall and never rise up again. Do you realize that Dan went into idolatry? They don't find it. They can't find the law of Jehovah or the words of Jehovah, because they have forsaken the fountains of living water, as the scripture says, and they have hewn themselves out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Do you remember that verse there? Let me just pull that one up. See? Broken cisterns. I didn't even think to bring that one up. It's just as I'm speaking these things, it's coming up to me. Um, for... Oh, goodness. Fountains. I don't know if I'm, I'm not spelling something right. Forsaken me. Yeah, here we go. Jeremiah 2.13 is where that's at. So let me just pull over here real quick to Jeremiah 2.13. And uh, here we go. Jeremiah chapter 2. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why has he become a prey? Now, it goes on. The young lions have roared upon him and let their voice resound. And they have made his land desolate. The cities are laid waste without inhabitant. The children also of Noph and Taphanes feed upon the crown of thy head. I did an amazing video on that a little while back. You know, Nof and Tophanes were Nephilim. That, that's what who they actually were. But they have forsaken. Literally, it would be Jesus Christ in this case here. They've forsaken him who, who is the fountains of living water. We know that because the scripture clearly bears it out. Now, so, but, the, the, you know, the whole problem is they are literally, there's a famine. It's not for bread, not for water, because Christ came. He was the bread of life. He was that living water. But for, they want to hear the words of Jehovah. And they can't find it. But then they're likened unto the tribe of Dan. Let's look at about Dan. What does it say? What, what was prophesied about Dan by his own father? What Yaakov prophesied. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent in the way. He's a serpent in the road, a horned snake in the path that biteth the horse's heels so that his rider falleth backward. I wait for thy salvation, O Jehovah. Dan becomes a serpent. Do you remember also in the book of Revelation, when you go through the tribes here, we're in Revelation chapter 7 right here, and I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. The tribe of Judah, Reuben, Gad, Nephtali, Asher, Manassas, uh, Simeon, Levi, Ishkar, Zebulun, Joseph, Benjamin. Not a single word mentioned of the tribe of Dan. Why? It's prophesied right there in Amos. Oh, they're here. They're here in modern days right now, the tribe of Dan. It is so obvious that they are here. 
I also find it interesting that in Genesis that they that that it says that a horned snake in the path. I think of the horns of the altar. And what are they after, though? Here Christ has come, and according to the scripture we read in the book of uh, uh, John, excuse me, book of, I'm sorry, this book of Hebrews, I want to go to John. In the book of John, chapter 7, in the last day, that great day, wait, let me back up just a little bit here. Do I have it a little bit higher? Wait a minute. That uh, The feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And this he spoke of the Spirit, which they believed on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. All right? But there he is. He is that living water. When we go over here to uh, John chapter 6, we read here, They said therefore unto him, What signs show you uh, then that we may see and believe you? And what do you do? And, and what, uh, what dost thou work? And our fathers did eat man in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. But my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. So that goes to show right there, Jesus is already saying, the bread they got from Moses didn't come from heaven. But the true bread is Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say, verse 33, For the bread of God is he which comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. That's the true bread. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall, what? Never thirst. That's why in Amos it could prophesy there would not be a famine for bread or for water. There's not a thirst for bread or water because as long as Christ came into the world, those that drank and ate from him are not in a famine. They're not hungry and they're not thirsty. But there is a group that comes in the world at the same time that those that are being fed with the bread of life and, and drinking from the fountain waters of Jesus Christ. But there's another group that clearly are identified with the tribe of Dan that are hungering and thirsting and looking for the words to hear the word of Jehovah going back to the law. And that's what amazes me. It amazes me to, without any question whatsoever. Listen, in closing, I want to share something with you guys as well. Let me just see. I have Micah highlighted too. Ah, not specifically for this message, I don't believe, but there was something I did run across and I wanted to share with you. Um, you remember when Hezekiah comes in and he destroys um, the golden or the brazen serpent on the brass pole? And again, it just makes me really think. I go back to when Jesus says to them, you know, uh, you know, if you being evil, you know how to give good gifts to your kids. If, which one of your kids, if you ask for a fish, would you give him a serpent? And he's referencing the Old Testament. It's very clear he's referencing the Old Testament, right? And, uh, and that always made me think, what was going on at that time? Um, and... And I'm not discounting the scripture where it says, you know, as the brass serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. I realize that. But I, then I was reading here in 2 Kings chapter 18, and I get to this part here. He removed the high places. What Hezekiah does? Break the pillars, cut down the Asherah, and he broke in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did offer to it, and it was called Nehushtan, is the way you see that in English, and that's the way it's transcribed everywhere. And it's the only place in the entire scripture that this Hebrew word is used. And it's actually a compound word. And I could not help but be amazed when I read this in Hebrew. Vikaralo nachash seitan is what it really says. I'm sure those of you that have a little understanding of Hebrew already know what I just said and what I read. But 
the rabbis added these vowels later for pronunciation purposes. But clearly, right here, nun chet is nachash. That's for serpent. They put a u vowel in there, right there, uh, underneath the chet, so that you would think it's pronounced nehu rather than nachash. Then, instead of putting the dagish over the sheen on the left side, which would make it a sin, they put it on the right side so you would not pronounce sheen tav nun as Satan, which is really what it is. They were doing offerings to this serpent on the pole that clearly was called Satan serpent. That's what it was called. And it represented, of course, sin being judged, the brass being sin being judged, but it represented the serpent on the tree that deceived Adam and Eve. And that was Satan represented as a serpent on the tree. I think it's so fitting. And, of course, because it was called Nachash Satan, they were offering sacrifices unto it. Basically, what happened, they got into idolatry. And no doubt, maybe got into the worship of Satan as a result of that. Do you know that this is also what Dan ended up doing? The tribe of Dan? They began to do the golden calf all over again. One of the reasons why they were not included in the tribes of Israel in the book of Revelation. Very interesting to see, but one of the main things to focus on, though, is they went looking for the words of Jehovah. They thirsted for that. They thirsted for a law. Tell me all these modern movements of people going back into those roots are not following into that very thing. Rather, than drinking. So you don't even have to thirst. You don't have to have a famine for bread because the bread, Jesus Christ being the bread of life and the waters of the living waters, it's there. You don't have to be in a famine. It is there for you right now. Why wait? Oh my goodness. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, I appreciate your time. And you see it right above the screen there, IsraeliNewsLive.org. If you want to support the work we're doing here, you can uh, donate via mail, Stephen Benoon, P.O. Box 156, Sunbright, Tennessee, 37872. Or you can just click right there online. You click that little button there online there, takes you to a donate page, any, any card you want to use. We greatly appreciate your help. Uh, it is desperately needed. And, uh, and I cannot wait to do, I'm about to do a message on the 21st degree Mason. I've done a message before, but a message was sent to my family. And they were sending the 21st degree Mason Noahide message to my family to shut us up. I have not decided yet where I'll air that at. Uh, I may air that over on Patreon only. But I do know for a fact we were to be silenced. My father-in-law paid with his life. Thank you for listening. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live.